Dr. Jerry, you got the whole world waiting. Been ready for you to start the conversation. No point of view, it got the haters confused. Leave it up to you to bring us all the good news. Positive vibes and the sex appeal to Dr. Andre Jerry. Can I get an interview? You, 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 you. Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to a special holiday episode of Live with Dr. Andre Jerry. I appreciate you sharing an hour of your evening with me, supporting this broadcast and the Artist First Network. So today is Thanksgiving Eve, and I have a fun fact about today that I don't think many people know about. Did you know that the day before Thanksgiving is also known as Blackout Wednesday or Drinksgiving? So apparently, because most people are off tomorrow, Thanksgiving Eve is widely known as the biggest binge drinking night of the year. Why am I just now finding out about this? All of these years, I could have had a legit reason to binge drink during the holidays, and I missed out. Well, anyway, if you're indulging tonight, enjoy yourself, have a drink for me, and of course, drink responsibly. Listen, we have a great show tonight. My guest and I will be discussing education, innovation, entrepreneurship, and black history. And no, we don't have to wait until February to talk about black history. Black history is woven throughout the fabric of this great country, and it's always a relevant topic. But when we think about historic black figures, we often think about the Titans, the MLKs, the Rosa Parks, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Hank Aaron, and Muhammad Ali. And yes, we know that these are prominent figures that have left an indelible imprint on American society, and we salute them. But tonight, however, we are honoring the legacy of an unsung historic black inventor whose groundbreaking invention that was patented in the 1920s impacted an entire industry and is still widely used today. Our guest today is the grandson of this unsung innovator and the author of the best-selling new book honoring his grandfather's legacy entitled Unsung But Forever Remembered the man who invented the automobile turn signal, David G. Bond. Please help me welcome to the show, Dr. Stephen Bond. How are you doing this evening, my friend? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing, Dr. Jerry? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Listen, thank you so much for making time to be on the show today. I know you and I have been planning this since September, so I'm excited to finally have you on the show. And I want to jump right in because we, we have a lot to touch on. But first, why don't you just go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. Well, I'm Dr. Stephen Bond. I was originally born in New York, Queens, New York, and um, I was raised on the island, New York. And um, I lived in Florida for 10 years, and then um, I moved to North Carolina nine years ago after my parents passed away. And so I've been educated now for the last 23 years. And education is something that's dear to my heart. I love teaching. I love education. I love just the idea of education where I believe that every student can learn. I love being in the classroom. I love making class work and just being in class entertaining, engaging, and fun. You know, I've been known to dress up in different outfits. I've known to be outside the box, as some people like to say. And I just love teaching in general. Uh, for most of my teaching career, I've taught uh, social studies, all genres of social studies, uh, American history, world history, civics, economics, and AP history and government classes. And uh, I've also taught ELA for about a decade, and I've taught science, physical science, and uh, chemistry. And so I just love just teaching. You know, some about teaching that I have a passion for and just energy for. And the great thing about it is it's infectious to the students. And I think what makes me stand out as a teacher is that I love to teach. I love what I do. I love teaching the children, and I love just when I see the students get it and understand the concepts and ideas. And what's amazing is that even though I've been doing this for over 20 years, most of the students that I did teach, I still report them today. They follow me on social media. They, uh, some of them are teachers as well. Some of them became lawyers. And they say, Dr. Bond, I remember when you said Mr. Bond, and, you know, you taught me in government class. You should dress as a judge, and we did court cases. Or they remember me teaching about the Middle Ages and having a, you know, a wig on my head and just being King Henry VIII. And so that love 
that I get is just amazing. And so that's just a little bit about me. Education is a big part of me. Um, I'm also an author. Uh, I do consulting. I do trainings on teaching social studies and language arts, keeping it relevant, keeping it engaging, keeping it fun, and also not just sitting in the classroom for a whole hour where you can't talk or move around. To me, learning deals with movement, music, listening, poetry. It's a whole plethora of ways to learn, and more teachers, I feel, need to go that route. Right, absolutely. And listen, I want to tip my hat to you and and to all of our educators in the public school system, but especially our black male educators, because as you know, only 2% of the nation's teachers are black males. So to, you know, to say that you're an an underrepresented demographic among educators is just really a gross understatement. And I admire the passion and the engagement and the fun that you bring to your learning. And I'm sure your students embrace you know, having a black man as their teacher, because it's it's just not very common. So I can imagine how well received you are by your students. Um, do you have a couple of stories that you can tell us about your experiences with students who have embraced your style of teaching? Sure. I have one student, and what's amazing is that this young man, he's one of the reasons why the book was printed. I taught him back in 2007. I was a history teacher, and before that point, I don't believe he had an African-American male teacher, you know, with few and far in between. And so I taught him in geography. You know, we have different uh, things we did in class. I would dress up and uh, I would do activities like, you know, we would write in different languages. So we would write like in Greek, write in Hebrew, write in different languages. You know, even when we did African history. And so that really just made the learning fun. And so what's amazing is that he still follows me and, when, before I wrote my last book, he was one of the reasons why. Uh, I was on Twitter one day, and this young man follows me. Mm-hmm. And they were doing a post about little-known black history facts, little-known inventors. And he puts in a post, he said, I want Dr. Stephen Bond to tell a story about his grandfather, how he invented signal light for cars, like he told us back in, like, 2007. I was like, wow, he remembers me telling that story. And so what's amazing is that it, it really motivated me to say, you know what? I need to really write the story. You know, I've written right. other stuff, but I was like, now is the time. I said, this boy put it on blast, as the kids like to say. I said, you know what? He really inspired me. I said, now nah, I really got to work with it. Because when he did the post, <laughs> a whole bunch of people commented. And I was like, it is true. And, you know, I hate it when people would doubt it. So I sent a picture of my grandfather. And I did want to send, because what happened later on, I did find his patent. But I told him, I said, my grandfather, David George Bond, they have a patent for it. And I said, you know what? Now I really have to do research and do the work for this book. Right. And he was one of the inspirations I had. And um, there's a couple of other young people who I taught. Uh, one young man, uh, his name is Raphael, and uh, I taught him in sixth and seventh grade. And I just coached him in flag football years ago, back in 2006. And, you know, he's a great kid. And, you know, I taught him not just social studies. And so I was told life lesson about being humble. You know, even when you play a sport, be humble. Yes. You, know, keep, you know, just remember it's a team, not just you. And then find out a few years later, you know, after I moved out of Florida, he's one of the top wide receivers in the country. And, you know, I follow him. He's like, Coach Bond, Mr. Bond, you're one of the reasons why I became the humble athlete I am today. Because one year, I actually reprimanded him and kicked him off the team for a while. Mm. And I'm going to make sure he is a story. And then, you know, he said to me, he, you know, he said, Mr. Bond, you're one of the reasons why I am to humble and a leader and not selfish. And I'm a humble man. And he won getting a scholarship. He went to community college and then he played for the University of Pitt uh, for a couple wow. of years with a lead wide receiver for two straight years. And he had a little uh, semi-pro league and he's doing well. And, you know, just to see how he grew and mature, I saw him at some of the football game. I'm like, wow, you, you're just swole. You're just built dude. And he was like, you know, he said he thanked me and other teachers. And so one thing I would always ask him is I would say, well, what is your GPA? Yes, I know you're putting the numbers up, but what's your GPA? And he was all <laughs> ACC as a academic 
All America because it's great. And those are stories that's why I get into teaching because those are kids you root for. And also I've had students who dealt with different learning disabilities. Uh, yeah. could have been dyslexia or ADHD or autism. And to see when they get older that they thrive in society, that they become teachers and doctors and lawyers. It's just amazing to see. One young lady I taught in, her name is Carmen. Yeah, I can say the name. And she is now, she got a doctor in pharmacy. And I remember when I taught her back in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and you know when you teach someone, you're like, she's going to go places. She's just right. smart love to learn and she was to learn the English language, but you knew like this girl's going to be somebody and to see her now being a pharmacist, graduating with a doctor degree. It's like, wow. I'm like, I remember when this girl was in my class and I remember teaching her and you just saw greatness in these students. And so those are just wow. a few of the stories that I have been an educator and, and especially when they remember you, you're like, wait, you remember me? And I taught you in 04 and 05 and 06. And so, and even up to a few years ago. And that's one of the reasons why you teach, because just when you know you've had an impact on people, you know, we have an unsung profession, but there are no doctors, mm -hmm. lawyers, teachers, physicians, none of these, none of these jobs unless they had a teacher that helped them along the way. That's absolutely true. And I want to circle back to something that you mentioned. You mentioned that some of your students have learning disorders such as dyslexia and ADHD and, and perhaps some other learning disorders that kind of inhibit their ability to learn the way other students do. What are some of the challenges that you see that these students face and how do you kind of level the playing field for them so that they have the same opportunity to learn as the other students? Usually what's interesting more than anything is that they need that confidence instilled in them because many times what happened for so long, people gave up on them. Sometimes yeah. the parents gave up on them. Sometimes teachers have gave up on them because kids know when you believe in them. Kids know when you care. Like I give affirmations sometimes, like sometimes for a test, they'll have affirmation where they'll say, I'm great. I will be great because greatness is in me. Right. And sometimes if I see them feeling a little bit low, I'm going to say, don't forget you got great to see you. Don't forget you're wonderful. You're specially made. And that goes a long way. So usually that's the first battle mentally, letting them realize that they're just as capable. And one of the strategies I do is I've never been a teacher where you have to sit down and be quiet for the whole period. You know, back then you move around too much. Oh, we're writing you up. Why? What did I do? Well, and so you learn that, kids learn by not just reading, but by writing, right. by listening, right. hearing music. And so I have my students write poems. I have them write plays. I have them listen to music. Uh, I have them do things which make the learning process more engaging. I have kids do journaling, and journaling is a great device because many times students will, when they have a good report that teacher, they'll discuss and say, you know what? I do have self-esteem issues. I do for low myself. So many times a mental battle mm -hmm. is the first battle that you have to tackle with these young students. And then what happens, I tell them whether it's ADHD, dyslexia, or, or what have you. Learn which strategy works best for you. Like if you have ADHD, read, take a little break, you know, calm your nerves, take a deep breath, and then go from there. And what I also do, I do let kids walk around. Mm -hmm. You know, they can dance, they can stretch out, and that helps with the flow of the blood, but also where it's not monotony. So it does not feel like work. And many times they'll say, Doc, your class go by so fast. I say, I know. And I say, it's why? Because I segmented, you know, we'll read maybe silently for 10 minutes. But if you do that, you get a break for three minutes. So if you walk around, you want to skip yeah. around, as long as we're not loud, you can do it. And so those little things help all those students. And why I tell students that whatever strategy works best for you reading, you know, with some students, you know, have organizers with Venn diagrams or graphs or what have you works well. I also let kids write it in their own way. You know, if they want to write a poem about it, let them. If they want to sing or give different references, you let them do that. And also right. when I would dress up and do other things, one, it makes the class more interesting. <laughs> and that goes a long way with classroom management and making it interesting. But what I tell the students is find out what strategy works best for you. Cause I've ADHD and I didn't learn that till uh, my late thirties. Mm. And it was like, wow, 
It makes sense. That's why I understood these students because that was me. And so I let them know my battles. I let them know when I had teachers write me off and say I was slow or just different or medial. And I just would tell them, I said, I'm not going to give up on you. And I tell them, whatever strategy works best for you. Because you can be on medicine, but medicine can only do so much. I said, learn what style works for you. What style, you know, if you're visual and you learn by visual stuff, that YouTube video can help you just as much as I can. That TikTok video where we were talking about the eight parts of speech, mm-hmm. you can learn that way. Uh, that video we did about the Egyptians, what they invented. You're watching it, you're listening, you're laughing, but at the same time you're learning. And so learning it also can be entertaining in a good way. And so I've learned those are devices. And sometimes I let the students say, you know, you're going to teach the class. In other words, you're going to do the skit. You're going to do the play. You're going to decide how we're going to learn this activity. You and know, you'll and find so that we they get, retain more of the lesson when they participate in that manner, right? They sure do. Because, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes teachers are scared to let kids do their thing. They're scared that the class yeah. going to get rambunctious and off the chain. <laughs> and so they, and so they play to conserve it. And it's like, you know, when you coach in a sport and you go for the juggler, you say, you know, what? I'm just going to be reckless. Sometimes you got to just be a little reckless and say, you know what? They're learning. That's fine. I did it this way. They're drawing, you know, they're cutting things out. They're making word walls. It's working. Let them do it. Let them, as long as they're behaving properly. Right. Let them do it. You know, if they want to give a speech, let them give a speech. Now, there's certain rules, certain language we're not going to tolerate. But I want to hear their opinion. You know, and that's what helps. You know, letting those kids become individuals and in a lot of ways teach themselves. I'm giving them just like the template for what they need. But they're right. digging in and researching for themselves. Um, they're making the work for themselves. Like in my world history class, we're going over the Greeks. And so I let them have the Greek alphabet. Next thing, I have one student, she wrote a whole paragraph in Greek letters. I said, Dr. Bob, what you read? I said, listen, Greek is not my first language. I have to read this slowly and surely. <laughs> but, but what these students were doing, they were making their own paragraphs. They are doing their own work. They're like, we can make our own plays. And that empowers the students. And what they remember more than anything else is I gave them that liberty. Like, they know I'm fun, but I'm firm. I give a certain structure. Right. You know, they're not going to say what they want. They're not going to misbehave. Because I teach manners. They're going to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. They're not going to say, if I call them and they say, what? No, it's yes, not That's what. Important. And, and so I saw that old school in me being 48 years old, and they get that from me. And so teaching is not just in that book or on that website. It's that life lesson, persevering. And I, tell, I told a few students today, I said, you persevered. You read, that, you read that prompt. You know, you may have been a little frustrated with some of the words, trying to pronounce it. You may have got a little off track, you know, maybe felt a little hyper or, you know, just a little um, – disoriented or lack of focus. But I said, you bounce back. Right. And that's what it's about. And many times, those are the smart students, the ones on the spectrum, dyslexia, ADHD, they have the creativity. And you have to let that creativity bloom and blossom. Because what happens many times, teachers will try to inhibit them. Oh, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do it that way. Let them do it their way. Absolutely. If Don't be working, rigid. Yeah. Yeah. Because every student learns differently. And I wish more teachers, especially when I was uh, coming up in school, it's like every teacher wanted to force students to learn the exact same way. And you really do your students a disservice when you do that. You really do. Uh, I remember I got this comment as a teacher and as a student. So when I did my math problems, I did it a certain way. I did it which made sense to me. Um and they would say, Stevie, you're doing it not the way you're supposed to. You're doing it wrong. And then I said, <laughs> well, if I'm doing it the way that is my way, but it's working, what's the problem? And I remember uh, I worked in one school, and the principal would just see the things we did in class. And um, she said, Mr. Bond, you're just outside the box. And <laughs> And I said, and I said it in a fun way, but a little bit sarcastic. I said, uh, I was never in the box. 
Because <laughs> I said he couldn't keep me out the box. So, and I mean that because while saying not to be mean to the principal, what I was saying is I've always been different and unconventional as a student. Mm-hmm. And I'm unconventional as a teacher. In other words, I'm going to do it a little differently. But guess what? Not only the results just as good, but sometimes the results are greater because those kids have learned. And so when you take them outside the box and don't restrain them, and they understand that confidence that they get, they realize mm-hmm. they learn from themselves. They're making their own things. They're creating. And, you know, when you look at Bloom's taxonomy, you know, the higher thinking is when you're evaluating, you're processing, you're making things. That's what it's all about. And don't be afraid to let the students do their own thing. And those are the things, to me as an educator, that stick out. And one of the things I'm most proud of was when I wrote Perseverance in a Strange Land, and that was the best selling book, sold in six different countries. I only wrote the wow. introduction to that book. Yes. It sold in France, in Germany, England, uh, Australia, and in Canada. And even now, people buy the book. And what's unique about the book is when COVID ended the school year in 2020, and George Floyd was murdered, I told the kids in class, just write about what you feel. I'll tell them if you're angry, if you're ticked off, you know, just using these expletives, but write how you feel. And so, so it was a journaling book, exercise, really. Exactly. And at first, you know, I wasn't even going to write to a book. I just wanted to know how they were feeling because some students need to have access to a computer. I would say, hey, text me your journey, what you feel. Something on computer, so I said, text it to me, email it to me, whatever you can. And so I started reading some of those journals. I was like, wow, they wrote some powerful stuff. You know, some students said we missed the social norms of school, not having Mm. a prom, not having a field trip, not seeing teachers. And I had one student, he said, I miss the structure of a classroom. And sometimes we think kids want discipline. But anytime kids want you to put them in check, as long as they're respectful. Mm -hmm. And so I remember a young woman, Levi, he wrote, I miss the structure of a classroom where the teacher is teaching, delegating, but it's a structure where they always get at home. You know, some students say, you know, just going to a restaurant, getting something to eat, getting a haircut is something that we took kind of took for granted. Going to a prom, even for teachers, we like the prom and wishing students off when they graduate, those things that we used to see. And, it, and even teachers were miserable because of it. And so some of the kids who play sports, they said, you know, my life is different because I can't play ball. You know, ball was the football, basketball. These were sports that kept me motivated to do well in school. Now it's gone. And some students said, I miss my favorite teachers. I miss my coaches. I miss my teachers that I like. And then when I had the chapter with George Floyd, I had students black, white, and biracial, and in between say, an injustice happened on TV that we just saw. So I took mm-hmm. a picture of it and recorded it, but it wasn't about black or white. It was about something was wrong. Yes, you could say race, but the point was that something was done wrong and people, young people were saying something had to be done. And so they wrote that before, you know, the case was finished, but here's what they were seeing. They were out of school because of COVID. So they're at home, they're bored, depressed, miserable. And now they see this happen with George Floyd and then later Breonna Taylor because that didn't come in the news till weeks later. And so these kids remember that. They felt the trauma. And, you know, looking back now, it was very hard for these students. Uh, The pressure was big, anxiety was big because at first they said, oh, we're going to be closed for a few weeks, school. Oh, we'll be closed in a month. Oh, no, we're going to be closed for the whole year. And that just was tough. I had one girl named Lauren McCoy, and she said, Mom was a nurse. She said, the hard part for me is that when my mother comes home, I can't hug my mother because she's been around these germs. If I hug her, she gets sick. And it was hurting for her because she's that type. She likes to hug. She hugs her parents. She hugs her teachers. You know, and so the little things like hugging your mother when she gets off work. Uh, one young man his dad had a heart issue. So he's like, I can't be around my dad because if I get COVID or if I'm around him, he has a pre-existing health condition. He gets sick. 
and he has a heart condition, he probably going to die. So this was this was the the platform for when that book was written. And that was the little part where I put word searches and puzzles in just to keep people getting bored. And then um, I get a little history biography, mini biographies like not just Martin Luther King, but also someone unsung. Like, for example, uh, Shirley Chisholm, who my mother met years ago, how she ran for president, you know, yeah. how she worked in Congress. You know, the ones you'll hear about uh, often in the news, uh, someone like Emeka Evers, who was assassinated. In other words, some of the unsung people that you'll hear about in the movements, because, yes, it's great to hear about Martin Luther King. It's great to hear about Malcolm X. But what about the ones who also paved the way, but history doesn't always talk about much? And that's why I'm glad I put the little biographies um, in the book of Mae Jemison, you know, the first African-American female astronaut. So a little biography on her. So people that you may not hear about on a day-to-day basis, I did little biographies of them for their accomplishments and their relevance in history. So I love that this book, not the one that we're featuring tonight, but Perseverance in a, in a, in a Strange Land, your first book, I love that you use this as an opportunity to allow the kids to journal and write about stuff that they were seeing in the news, stuff that they were feeling traumatized by, stuff that has been impacting them. And a lot of them had an opportunity, since they were at home a lot, to reflect and think about some of the things that they maybe used to (laughs) complain about, which was the structure and the rules. But when you take that away, you know, the students are able to reflect and see the value in some of that structure um, that, that the, the teachers and the, the school provides for them. So this was a great exercise, and I love that you published it. Um, and, and I definitely want the readers to, to go on to Amazon and whatever other platforms that you have this book, Perseverance in a Strange Land. You'll get to hear and read about stories that really are touching and that have impacted students. Um, in, in a way that kind of helped heal them and, and get them through those transitional periods. Right now, we're going to continue this conversation in a moment, but right now I want to take a quick commercial break. And when we return, we're going to talk more with Dr. Stephen Bond about his new book and his grandfather's legacy. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hey ladies, have you ever dated a married man? Have you ever thought to yourself, that would never be me? Have you ever wondered, how could she? Have you ever said, she should be ashamed of herself? Well, I used to say those same things, and I've pointed fingers that I don't point anymore, because now I am that other woman. What do you do when you meet a man that makes you question everything you thought was wrong? Where do you go when life has led you into a dark place where society frowns upon you and even your own mother is disappointed in you? Who do you turn to for guidance and support when there's no one you can share your secret with? Life is more complex than the list of rules you've been taught throughout the years. Situations are not always black and white. Sometimes your mind and your heart don't want the same thing, and you find yourself in a battle between right and wrong. I never understood how women got themselves in these situations until I was that woman. We don't always seek the circumstances we end up in. Although many people may not understand, there are some that do. If you ever find yourself dealing with a forbidden love, How to Date a Married Man, 10 Rules of Engagement, written by Dr. Andre Jerry, is a must-read. It's not comprised of judgments and lectures, but rather rules of engagement that you must apply when you find yourself the other woman in his life. Ready to learn more? The controversial new book, 
How to Date a Married Man, 10 Rules of Engagement, written by relationship expert Dr. Andre Jerry, is now available for sale exclusively on Amazon and Kindle. Hey, yo, Vaughn, throw the 808 on that bitch. I told my wife and my mama I will only let that pain strengthen me It's making me stronger And I know I am the way I am Cause of all of them traumatic experiences I've been through some trauma I'm ready for hell finally I'm ready to listen now I wasn't ready then I just wasn't ready I know it took a while for me to actually want to smile more But I've been trying to be a better man And I'm getting better Look, yeah. I kept my head up when it felt like I was gonna drown Absolutely nowhere to go I had nobody around Overwhelmed by the pain And suffocated by doubt Man, it's just crazy to think That I still found a way out I did it on my own too Who am I kidding? Gotta thank my wife Cause I couldn't have done it without you And I thank God every single day that I found you If I die today Then a legacy is what I leave behind but I promise, baby, you gon' be just fine I hope we got time for we reach that line Cross that line, then leave this life I know a whole lot that be on your mind Be hard for you to even think sometimes But we know that time is coming We can't avoid it I just wanna live in the moment Cause life is short I told my wife and my mama I will only let that pain strengthen me It's making me stronger And I know I am the way I am Cause of all of them traumatic experiences I've been through some trauma I'm ready for hell finally, I'm ready to listen now I wasn't ready then, I just wasn't ready I know it took a while for me to actually want to smile more But I've been trying to be a better man And I'm getting better, yeah. I just want to hold you tight and fall asleep in your arms And any problems we face, they cannot go unresolved I would trade my life for your happiness in the beat of a heart You were the light to my path, you helped me see in the dark And I found my way home it all started off by you telling me I need to stay strong I have every right to feel the way I do and that I ain't wrong But my feelings can't be expressed through my anger Man, when I tell you I've been blessed with an angel She keeps it real when she tells it Her presence is angelic Her love is my drug, her love is my psychedelic Girl, I need you forever, I hope our souls live forever And I don't know how that works, but God, I sure hope you let us I told my wife and my mama I will only let that pain strengthen me it's making me stronger And I know I am the way I am Cause of all of them traumatic experiences I've been through some trauma I'm ready for hell finally I'm ready to listen now I wasn't ready then I just wasn't ready I know it took a while for me to actually want to smile more But I've been trying to be a better man And I'm getting better I know it took a while for me to actually want to smile more But I've been trying to be a better man And I'm getting better man. I'm ready for help, finally I'm ready to listen now I wasn't ready then I just wasn't ready You're back live with Dr. Andre Jerry. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show So you just finished listening to the brand new track by independent artist Jill Brown entitled Better produced by Von Make Hits and is now available on all streaming platforms and I want to congratulate Jill Brown on the success of his new single, which is now being played on Red 94.5 in Lincoln, Nebraska, and now other stations across the country. But remember, you heard him first right here on Artist First Radio Network. And if you're an author, entrepreneur, or independent artist who'd like your latest project featured on our show, send my team an email at livewithdrandrejerry at gmail.com, and we'll get you set up. Now, if you're just joining us, our guest today is Dr. Stephen Bond, who is an educator and author of the best-selling new book, Unsung But Forever Remember, which is a story which honors the legacy of the man who invented the turn signal, David G. Bond, who also happens to be his grandfather. So before the show, we talked a little bit about your background as uh, an educator and some of the ways that you engage your, your students and, and your passion for learning. In this segment, I want to talk more about your book. Uh, but first, before we get into the book, tell us a little bit about your grandfather, David George Bond, his background, and why it was important for you to preserve his legacy. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Jerry. My um, my grandfather, David George Bond, he was a simple but intelligent man from the country in Low County in North Carolina called Bert T. And he lived in Windsor, North Carolina. And so he was a man that did not have much formal education, really, until he went and went to an all-black boarding school in Martin County, North Carolina. And so... Before that time, he just worked in a sharecropping farm, you know, harvesting peanuts, tobacco, and cotton. And so as he go up to the boarding school, he has a vision that says, you know what? Cars should have signal lights because back then cars didn't have signal lights. Uh, you had to stick your arm out to signal left, right, you know, the signal. Also, the brake lights were not lighting up or sl- when you slow down. So my grandfather, at the age of 16, start inventing a signal light for cars, the blinker. And so he got materials from the school. He worked on it when he was done with his vocational classes and just be up building it. And then he got to a point where he had it working, where if you pressed it, you know, when you pressed the light, the, it was signal left, right. And so it also would have a brake light. And so what he did, he had his sister, which is my great aunt, do an application to have a patent for it. And so at the age of 20, he had a patent March 3rd, uh, 1927. And he had one of the first original patents for the signal light. And his had all the parts, the signal for left and right blinking and also a brake light. And so to make this invention at the age of 20 was phenomenal. Um, he had blueprints on how it would look, how it would work, Step by step by step. And what he also did, because, you know, this was the Jim Crow South, he made sure he went through the proper protocol. He made sure uh, that it, he applied for it like he was supposed to, gave explanation for each part. And then he had signed off on it, and he had his lawyer signed off for it as well. His lawyer's name was Larry Lacey, because uh, I did about three or four months of research to find out about this patent. And so in March of 1927, it was officially considered a patent by U.S. government, and he had a patent number as well. So he had a U.S. patent number for the invention. He had the drawings, the explanation for it, just like any other um, patent has now, even when you invent something. Now, the issue came where patents expired, have expiration dates, almost like a driver's license. Now, fortunately, in the Jim Crow South, he was not able to no, sell it to one of the big companies like GM was around at the time. He was not able to sell it to a big company. And so along with that, uh, he was not able to benefit financially from it. And as time went on, when it was time for the patent to expire, he was trying to get money, raise money to um, renew it. And so he tried and tried. You know, I interviewed my aunt, which was his oldest daughter, who's still alive. She's 85. He went to three banks in Bertie County. They all rejected him. And... He was hurt by it because nowadays you have a good event. You go to a show like Shark Tank, they'll fund you the money. And even right. if, you know, you still get a substantial amount. So even when you watch uh, Shark Tank, you know, they're selling the idea, but they're still getting millions for it. So he kept looking, kept looking. He was trying to find people that could uh, help him. And he even went up to people, my aunt told me, he said, if you go half with it, I'll give you half the profit. And they also have to be careful because, one, People try still his idea to mm-hmm. being an African American male in the Jim Crow South, where there were lynchings in the counties nearby. Uh, as I did the research, there were lynchings in the counties nearby him. Uh, Martin County had lynchings. Uh, even Pasquotank County and the other counties in Eastern Carolina had lynchings in the last few years. So, as an African American male, you got to be really careful. He so, unfortunately, yeah. very, very, oh, and um, he, yes. And he disclosed discreetly that he did get some threatening letters. Now, there were some good letters where people didn't want to buy, uh, want to, attempted to buy the uh, invention. But you have to be careful because if too many people knew about it in a small town, they would try to kill him before he could describe it. And okay. um, and it was told that my aunt, they did get some harassing letters saying they would try to threaten to kill his children. And he voted a few times, so they said, well, we'll kill your 10 children. And my oh, grandfather man. wasn't scared oh, of people. Oh. Yeah, it's sad. And so he was like, well, I'm not scared of anyone. But how do people know I got 10 children? And so he laid back a little bit. No, he never showed a letter to anyone. 
Um, and so the patent expired. Now, the one thing which might be my next book is I would definitely like to know who did buy the patent and got the money compensation for the invention. And for me, there's no bitterness, none at all. Uh, right. My question is, I just want to know because uh, more than anything, I just want my grandfather to be vindicated. In other words, I want to pick up a book of inventors, not just Black History Month, and I wanted to say David George Bond had a patent for the signal light for cars. So get the credit. So it's not about money, but out right. of curiosity, I would like to know who brought it because, you know, obviously had to pay for it and um, they had the money for it where my grandfather didn't. And so the great part of the story is that he was never bitter. He was resilient. He raised 10 children and then later on adopted a young girl that was abandoned at a Greyhound bus station. And he named her, well, my grandparents named her Priscilla Gail Bond. My grandmother name was Priscilla, and she got the last name Bond. So here's a man who could have given up. Dr. Bond, Priscilla? Uh, no, unfortunately, she did pass. Uh, uh, several oh, years ago, God. she did pass. Well, yeah, it, it's sad. And, and one reason why I had that urgency to write this is because most of his children have passed. Right now, mm -hmm. currently, only two of his children. One is my uncle William, who's in uh, Germany, Mannheim, Germany, and my auntie, who lives in Windsor, North Carolina, nearby where all this occurred. And so the other nine, my dad included with that, has passed, and he passed two years ago. So I really have a sense of urgency to get this done while at least some of them were alive. For my aunt right. to get a copy of the book in her hand and to cry and say, nephew, this is like for my father. And she cried mm. about it. I was like, yes, auntie, this is for y'all. That was your day. That's my grandfather who I saw. But that was your father. And so I'm glad this could be put in the book. And I even put down all 11 of his children yes. in the book, their names and everything, because I felt they deserved that. Because here, he gave up on life. He still raised children. He still had businesses. He would you know, sell fertilizer and did farming. And he left this earth. He built a house in 1956 from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So he said he built a house that's still is owned by the Bond family, and it's still in Windsor, North Carolina. So it's a story that instead of tragedy, he persists and persevered in triumphs and raised 10 children who, were doing, who did well for themselves, you know, all 11, and grandchildren who are leading the Bond legacy and are doing well and yes. want to honor him by having this book written on his behalf. And so I'm just honored that this was able to be printed when I found his patent. After like a three-month Google search, patent search, nationwide search, and every other type of search, I was like, hey, man, I found it with his right. name on it, with the patent number on it, with his drawing, with the signature, because he had a very distinct signature. I like, wow. Is it I've awesome? Searched, I've searched through Google patents, and, you know, that's a lot of information to wade through. So the fact that you put all this research together and was able to find this stuff is just remarkable. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Jerry. There were times when, um, you know, I would be up late, 2, 3 in the morning, just trying to figure out, just trying to find it. I'm like, okay, I got to keep looking. I got to keep looking. And that was my motivation as well. But it took a long time. There were times I was like, you know what, I'm just giving up. But I was like, I can't. I said, I can find it. And so when I did, to me, that was the biggest accomplishment to find it because when you have a U.S. patent number, it doesn't matter who bought it. It still has that number and a person who originally had it name on it. So it has mm -hmm. a David George Bond living in Quitsna, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And the date it was submitted, January 1926, and the date it was officially confirmed as a legal patent, March 3rd, 1927. So, so for he me, was 20 it's just an honor. years old when the, the patent got approved? Yes, he was 20 years old. That's it. And he was so 16 he, when he, he started the patent. He was a teenager. Venture. Right. So that's what I was talking to you about yesterday when we had our pre-interview meeting. Your grandfather was really a prodigy. You know, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, there's no telling how many inventions he had. He just submitted and got a patent for one. He could have had numerous inventions that 
well, you know, he didn't even apply for because of, you know, all the hell he went through trying to get the first one and the threats and everything. So it's, there's no telling how that discouraged him from pursuing other patents that he may want to uh, get approved. Exactly. He was definitely an electric project. When it came to electricity, he was just a genius. My grandfather, before it was even cool, had motion sensor lights in his house. So whereas the lights go off, the moment wow. someone walked in the room, it would just light up. Whether they'll pass for it or not at the time, don't know. But he came with so many ideas. He came up with a, a hole, a cultivating hole that moved automatically. And so he just had things in his backyard. He had things in uh, the back of his house, a whole bunch of gadgets he invented. And he didn't even try to get padded. And there was a frustration because I remember one time my father telling me, because they didn't talk about it much. It was like mm-hmm. lecture, but one time he did make a comment where he thought about patenting something else, and my grandmother was like, well, why? So I'm going to try to steal your invention again. And so, yes, there was a frustration. He didn't show it, display it much, but I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was thinking, dang, you know, I had one billion-dollar invention that I didn't get credit for. Why spend the time, the energy to do it again? And I'm not getting credit, but yes, he was definitely a prodigy to invent at age 16. Imagine if you know, he did, you know, um, get the credit and compensation. This man could have been like Albert Einstein or Louis Latimer, these other, you know, he was definitely a genius and prodigy. To think about this at 16 and say, wow, cars have signals, so you know they're going left or right. And now to think about that, like, wow, let me do something. Let me create it. Let me have it blink yes. so people driving feet, several feet away can see the, the light blinking. Oh, so that's seeing the left or seeing the light uh, to the right. So instead of when it's raining and you can't see someone's hand sticking out, <laughs> I can see the light because my grandfather, Joe, he said, listen, for a dark skin people, A, hey, if you're driving in the dark, you ain't going to be able to see no left, left arm sticking out the window. You're not going to be able to see that. So he was right. And he also said if, when it's raining, who wants to stick their arm out? Roll the window down in the rain and take the arm out and say, I'm signaling left or signaling That's right. Crazy. You know what? I'm just going to keep my arm <laughs> in the car and just keep it dry. So it was simple, but such a wonderful, meticulously crafted device. It was. I, I can't imagine having to stick your hand out of the window to signal. And you made a good point. If it's dark, and you're dark skinned on top of that. Exactly. May may not, right. So that's a safety issue. So, yeah, like you said, a simple invention, but innovative to, you know, just to say the least. And, yeah, it's still used today. And like you said, it's on forklifts. It's on all types of vehicles, just not cars. And so there's no telling how many billions and billions of dollars this invention has generated. You've got to write a book about <laughs> you know, following up and, and trying to get in contact with that family, not so much for, for monetary benefit, but just to make that connection and to see who they are and and, and what their legacy is and, and just to get more information. That could be your, your next book. And, you know, another good book idea would be about your relative Priscilla. That story about how your grandparents adopted her and that whole thing, I think that's a story that may actually need to be told as well. You know, that's a fascinating story, too, and you're not the first person to say that because here he had 10 children, um, and his children worked on the sharecropping farm and became successful. And here you adopt one legally. You no, know, people say, wait, you already had 10? You adopt another one. And that in itself, you know, is an amazing story. And uh, even with my aunt who's still alive, uh, my auntie Ethel uh, Bond Reed Goddard, where she was assistant superintendent in Bertie County Schools, being the first female, period, to be in a superintendent office in Bertie County. That in itself was amazing. And um, she went to Elizabeth City State. She also went to uh, San Diego State, where she got a master's, and she was a mathematician. And back then, there still was a lot of sexism where women were not supposed to be scientists or mathematicians. So she was another tough person. To say, listen, yes, I'm a woman, I'm a mathematician, and yes, I'm assistant superintendent in this school system. And so 
No, we at Bonds, we've had some trailblazing positions and uh, accomplishments. And so, you know, think about my auntie Priscilla Gale Bond and my auntie Ethel, you know, Reed Bond Goddard. You know, there's there's a couple other stories that definitely should be told. That mm-hmm. unsung just like my grandfather and it's intriguing and fascinating and it shows the level of perseverance. Because sometimes we do get upset. But my grandfather said, You know what, yes, I did not get compensation with invention. But yet, I'm going to raise 10 kids. We may not have the biggest house because that house he raised them in, maybe about 1,500 square feet. And you have a oh. wife and 10 mm-hmm. kids. I know they all want to live that because the age gap. So I know someone going to college. But the point is that to raise that family in a house and have it paid for and so owned by the bond, that shows the accomplishments and right. the wherewithal that he had. He didn't let the frustration get to him. I'm sure there are times it's like, you know what? Man, I probably could have owned all of Bertie County. <laughs> At least I could have owned Windsor. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I should have owned every house on this block. But he was a humble man. And, you know, I remember growing up, raised in New York, we would visit North Carolina almost every year. And we see the cotton fields. And we would say, wow, our ancestors picked all the cotton fields by themselves by hand. They picked the peanuts out the ground by hand. You know what I mean? They 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 picked the tobacco and did all that work manually. And like, wow, that's some perseverance of a people. And that lets you speak to the strength that they had. And for me, this book is honoring my ancestors, and that's the point of it all. And you know, I look sometimes to picture my grandfather. Uh, the publisher did an awesome job. Uh, with the digital pick because I found an old pick of my grandfather back from like 19, like 1964, a long time ago. He had on a black, <laughs> he had on a, a black suit and a bow tie. And those who know me, I love wearing bow ties as well. And so I got that picture. And so <laughs> it, it's funny on now. The cover of the book. Yeah, it's a piece on the cover, but what happened, it was digitalized. Because when I showed it to the publisher, they said it was like too old to like try to put it in the book, but it digitalized, and he did a wonderful job recreating, because that was my grandfather. And so, and then wow. I, the picture of me in the back, I'm wearing a bow tie as well, and my grand, my dad loved bow ties as well, so it was like three generations of bow tie wearing black men that were sharp and, you know, intelligent. And I was saying between my grandfather, <laughs> my father, and myself, <laughs> My grandfather and my father were more intelligent than I was because my father was an engineer at Connets in New York. So electricity and understanding electricity was just in the their DNA. DNA. Yes, in indeed. DNA. Listen, I, everyone, this book is called Unsung But Forever Remembered, the man who invented the automobile turn signal, David G. Bond. I'm so glad that we got to have you on this evening, and we got to share with our listeners a little bit about your grandfather's legacy. I think he left a great legacy, not just the invention, but like you said, the 11 children and countless grandchildren who are, you know, from educators to politicians, entrepreneurs, perseverance, not acquiescing to bitterness, although he had plenty of reasons to be bitter with the way he was treated and the way his invention was um, or legacy was kind of stolen from him. But I, I love that he had a, a, a um, persevering spirit, and that de- I definitely see that in you. I love the fact that you took the opportunity to do all this research. I know it took you a while to do it, but the book is really beautiful. It's a, it's a quick read, um, but I think that it's a story that needed to be told. I look forward to seeing you on TV shows and um, and, and, and maybe some other productions coming down the line that, that may kind of further put your grandfather's legacy out there. But I want to thank you for your time today um, on this show. Before we wrap up, tell our listeners where they can connect with you online and on social media so they can find out more about you. Sure. Uh, my Instagram is Dr. Stephen Bond, one word, D R S T E. P H E N B O N D. I'm also on Twitter, um, Stephen Bond seventy four. I also have TikTok, uh, Doctor Stephen Bond, just as well. 
and both on my Instagram and uh, also on my TikTok. I do have some of the videos I've done with my students uh, from chewing basketballs and giving uh, Supreme Court cases to uh, Im- Im- imitating uh, TikTok challenges like we did an imitation where they had to slap the teacher challenge where the student act like they were going to slap me, but they gave the breakdown of his, uh, in history of Supreme Court cases. And so we did parodies of it. Uh, we did also um, the crate challenge where people were just so silly on TikTok. They were going on the little crate and falling. And so I faked like I was go- going to do the crate challenge. And then I had a student, which I have every year, I challenged students could they memorize the preamble of the Constitution. And it got to a point they could say the whole preamble of the Constitution, I'd give them $5. Well, one year it got to a point where I had to decline it and just give them two bucks a piece. Got about 100 students remember the whole preamble. And so that video had about 20,000 views. That's the type of engagement we need from our teachers. But, Dr. Bond, listen, we're running short on time. Thank you again for all of your passion that you put into your work. Thank you for the engagement that you have with your students. I know they'll remember it from years from now. Uh, So I'm pretty sure they'll circle back around to you after they've had their great success, remembering all the love that you pour into your work. Thank you again. That's our show for tonight, folks. Join us again on December 28th, where I'll have Freddie Beloy, comedian Freddie Beloy on. So that should be a really interesting and fun show. We'll see you again. Thank you again for tuning in and have a good night, everyone. Take care.